Today's series of Doplexus KL interviews we have with us Dr. Saurav Jain who is a consul consultant ophthalmologist at the Royal Free Hampstead NHS Trust and holds an honorary appointment at the University College London Hospital. Dr. Jain has a special interest in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus. He is also a member of Lo Royal College of Ophthalmologists International Trabismologist Association, American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Trabismus and European Association of Trabismology. Thank you, sir, for this interview. So let's begin with the first question. As you have a special interest in strabismus, can you brief on various causes uh, of it in children? Thank you very much for the kind invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here in Coimbatore. So strabismus in children can have various causes, but the way I like to think of them is those related to heredity and those that are not inherited. So if there's a family history of strabismus, you will find a significant higher proportion of children in that family go on to develop strabismus. However, we know that is not the only reason for people to develop strabismus. Your environment plays a big factor. For example, following measles or infective conditions in childhood, a lot of children develop strabismus. It's not the measles that causes the strabismus, the fact that you have an inherent a nature to develop a strabismus that gets precipitated by measles. Also, a third and more rare cause is uh, acquired cranial nerve palsies, like third and sixth nerve palsies in children that can cause an acquired strabismus. So moving on to the next one, what are the different types, signs and symptoms of strabismus in children? So the best way to look at it is to look at strabismus that's uh, with the eyes pointing inwards or esotropias or ch children with the po eyes pointing outwards or exotropias. There's also a small proportion of children who have hyper or hypotropia the, when the eyes are pointing up or down, but that is quite rare. So it's very interesting that in the East, which is where we are now, exotropias in children are much more common, whereas in the West, esotropias are much more common. Taken as a whole, in the world because of the population gradient, exotropia in childhood is a much more common condition than esotropia. So those, that's how I like to grade the uh, strabismus in children. So doctor, according to you, which diagnostic approach should be followed for accurate diagnosis of strabismus? I think the most important thing for this condition, as in, as in, in the case for most conditions to be honest, is a good history and a good examination and that will give you all the clues you need. For example, in a child with strabismus, what you want to know is when was the onset? Was it at birth? Has it come about suddenly? Has the child complained of any double vision? Are they closing one eye? That will tell you whether it's an acute or a long-standing strabismus. The thing you want to know in the history is there any, any family history of strabismus or a lazy eye or glasses that the parents wear and that will also give you an idea whether this is an inherited or an acquired condition. Now in the examination, examining the vision is very, very important because uh, that will again give, you the, uh, give you an idea whether there's associated amblyopia or not. So, and you have to use age appropriate and age specific visual uh, assessment methods. And when it comes to examining the squint, a good cover test is really invaluable. And to do that, what you only need to do is get the child to look at a toy or an object held at a third of a meter, cover one eye and then cover the other eye to see the movement of the eyes. And that will tell you whether the squint is alternating or fixed. Apart from that, a good refraction is really key. A good psychopathic refraction will tell you that there's an accommodative component to the squint. That is important because it will help you treat it by giving them the appropriate refractive correction. Also, a good fundoscopy is essential. Why? Because it will rule out things like associated cataract or retinoblastoma or any fundal abnormality that may be leading to the cataract. So, to summarize, a good history and examination will give you most of the clues you need, really. Uh, vision screening for preschool children is often difficult and challenging. So how would you access uh, the visual acuity in these patients? That is a very good question and it has been shown now time and time again that the most cost effective uh, thing you can do is screen for amblyopia in children because it is a condition that if can be successfully treated and also if left untreated has a lifetime of misery associated with it. The easiest way to do this is to engage the health professionals in the school. What we do in the UK is we have, uh, we have tried to engage the school health nurses to, to administer the vision screening. It's done by a very simple laptop-based method in which the children are encouraged to read 
letters on a laptop from a distance of six meters away by covering one eye. It's a very simple and very effective method. The other thing you can do is use a photo screener. That is again a very, very easy device to use, quite inexpensive and all it needs to do is to take a, a, a picture of both eyes of the child and compare the red reflex and they'll give you in an instant a quite a good idea of whether anything else needs to be done. Right. Uh, superior oblique palsy is a common cause for vertical strabismus in adults and in children. Which surgical interventions would you suggest for such cases? So the first thing I would say as for every squint is not every superior oblique palsy needs an operation. However, a lot of them do. The reason I would choose to operate is the child adopts a, a constant head posture or there is a significant amount of vertical diplopia in primary gaze or they are finding it difficult to read especially when they look down. So the commonest approach that most of us fa uh, fancy is an inferior oblique weakening procedure. It's an easy procedure to do. Most of us are quite familiar with it and you can get quite good results with this especially if you anterize inferior oblique at the same time as weakening it. In some cases, however, if there is a lot of torsion, especially in down gaze, and if uh, most of the deviation is in down gaze, you prepare of doing a superior oblique tuck. Again, this is an operation not commonly performed, but actually not difficult to do once you know the basics and can be very, very effective indeed. Those are the two procedures I favor most. You can also do an inferior recession in the other eye, but I usually save it for the second or third operation because it's an unreliable operation and can cause a change in the position of the lower lid. Uh, so lastly, doctor, what are the current trends and the, or the recent advancements in the management of uh, strabismus in children? So a few things have come about which are quite exciting. The first thing is the use of binocular iPad-based treatment of amblyopia and that has because so far amblyopia has been treated for 2,000 years by closing one eye and using the other one. And as you can imagine, this is quite distressing to the child and to the family. Uh, this new concept of using polarizing glasses and using an iPad with exercises, I think is quite revolutionary and it's been shown to be as effective as conventional patching. The other thing that I use now a lot is a toxin for strabismus, not just in adults but in childhood as well. And it can give you very good results with minimal intervention. The third thing I think that will come about more and more is the use of uh, automated detection devices to look at ocular alignment and that will save uh, unnecessary trips to the, to the doctors by worried patients so they can tell you whether the eyes are aligned or not aligned, whether there is a true or pseudo strabismus. Right. Thank you so much for the interview. It was a pleasure having you here. Thank you very much.